Uh, today we are going to continue our discussion on capitalism. Um, yesterday we discussed about Italian capitalism. Today <coughs> uh, the perspective is more a world perspective. We have with us uh, Sam Bowles, uh, who comes from the Santa Fe Institute um, in New Mexico, right? Is that? Uh, the Santa Fe Institute, uh, I didn't know it before, but it looks like a very interesting place to be, uh, where anthropologists, physicists, sociologists meet together to study complex systems. And one of these complex systems may be perhaps the firm, civil society, the complex between society and the firm. So it looks like a very interesting field of study. Uh, now, Sam Bowles presents a paper. Uh, uh, the title is Shrinking Capitalism. Uh, actually, the, the specific part on shrinking capitalism got a bit uh, uh, reduced here, but now uh, Sam will... Uh, explain to us maybe a little bit the genesis of, of uh, his work. Please, Sam, up to you. Thanks. Uh, I'll... Hi. Um, it's good. Um, I'll take the liberty of standing up. I can see you more easily uh, from this position. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here, uh, and I, um, I know that we're... We're, we're discussing today very pressing questions about the structure of Italian economy and society and also by extension other societies. Uh, uh, I will be talking about some general problems about uh, capitalism and particularly about how we should address the problems of capitalism. And let me say the main point of my talk to begin with. I think it's essential that in thinking about the future, there are two words which rarely appear in economics which should be integrated into economics and into our thinking. The first one is dignity, dignity. And the second one is power. These two words are obviously very closely connected and I'll explain to you how that is. And I'll also provide a method, a very simple one, a visual one for taking some steps to think differently about the way the economy is by bringing in civil society and in particular bringing in firms as a kind of social organization. Um, I'm going to start with um, what I've learned over the past couple of years from COVID. Um, the, uh, um, and also I'll, I'll, I will also talk a bit about what I, how economics has changed. Um, I think you probably know that as early as March and April, just at the very beginning of the pandemic, there was already a battle beginning for the narrative about COVID. What are we going to learn from this? So for example, The Economist says, big government is needed to fight the pandemic. What matters is how it shrinks back afterwards. A pandemic government is not fit for everyday life. Well, they're taking one position, but interestingly, read this now from the Financial Times. Quite a different view. Uh, this is from the editorial board, not just from a particular writer. Radical reforms reversing the prevailing policy directions in the last four decades will need to be put on the table. Governments will have to accept a more active role in the economy. Policies until recently considered eccentric, such as basic income and wealth taxes, will have to be in the mix. So you think about those two very respected journals. Uh, they're engaged in a in a tug of war between right and left, essentially between governments and markets. And this, this is the way they see the world. Uh, the policy space is a line. Any point on that line is a point in a distribution of policies either more market-like or more state-like. The examples I've given here concern environment. I will give later in the talk examples concerning COVID policies, economic policies, and so on. But this is the terms of the debate which I just gave between the economist on the one side and uh, the FT on the other. Now, uh, there is a problem with seeing the world this way, at the, the policy space being a line, um, because 
it ignores a lot that we've learned from the pandemic and a lot also that we economists have learned over the past couple of decades. I would summarize the first thing that we've learned is that good laws and good incentives are no substitute for good citizens. Uh, we've seen this. Uh, uh, I mean, if, if citizens are amoral and self-interested, uh, there is no way that the policies which we can design, no matter how clever we are, there is no way that a society can be intelligently and rationally ruled if the citizens are entirely self-interested or amoral. And by the way, there are very few great economists who have ever doubted that, starting, of course, with Adam Smith. Uh, let me give you a, a brief example here. During the, the last couple of years, I've done some research on the question of uh, vaccination resistance. Why are people not being vaccinated? Uh, and in a number of surveys, in this case in Germany, we've asked, how do you feel about being vaccinated and other policies too, mask wearing and many other policies? Um, there, these are the results. If you look at the white bars, the, the left-hand white bar is, how do you feel about being vaccinated if it's voluntary? The right-hand bar is, how do you feel about being vaccinated if it's enforced? Uh, the light-colored bars, bars is one survey. The dark-colored bars is a later survey. We've done surveys. This is of the same people again and again. And my co-author, uh, Katrin Schmelz, is there. Now, this is interesting because, essentially, if you look at policy, policy sciences, there is a, there's a basic idea. We have constraints and we have incentives. That's what we work with. In this case, the constraint itself would turn people against the policy. Uh, and, uh, and I think, uh, in many cases, already has. By the way, I'm not opposed to mandates at all, but I am in favor of when we, when we design policies, we should take account of the fact that we depend on citizens wanting to comply with what the government is ad advising. And if we undermine that, we have a problem. Okay. Um, the second thing we've learned is there are plenty of good citizens. They, I mean, we, I don't have to give you examples of the tremendous heroism, generosity, and so on of people during the pandemic uh, that have given themselves, uh, and in many cases given their lives, uh, in, in caring for others and so on. There is no lack of good citizens. But the final thing, uh, I say this as, a, as an American, uh, uh, there is also, when we think about what economists call other regarding preferences, there is a big danger here. Among the preferences which we may have that go beyond self-interest is tribalism. From America, you have the wonderful expression, the Chinese virus, uh, and so on, uh, and uh, kinds of protectionism and, let's say, vaccine mercantilism as a kind of tribal response to the uh, pandemic. Um, so I'll go back to the Financial Times. Uh, Ethical concerns are important in making a society work well, so we have to think about how are they cultivated. Uh, again, this is an editorial from the New York Times. It's talking about the need for a new social contract. Uh, I'd like you to consider the fact that what we need is not that line in the picture I gave you, but we need another poll. Uh, which would open up a space for policies. I call the poll civil society, but it refers to such things as solidarity, duty, community, and so on. Now, uh, the, the picture there is, of course, of volunteers delivering uh, food. Uh, here's another example. In almost every country, we had a list of who were the essential jobs uh, and who, therefore, should uh, have privileges about schooling and so on. Look at the jobs here and then ask yourself, what are the wages being paid to these people who are so essential that they are singled out as being the ones who should have their kids in school and so on? Uh, there is a tendency in economics and in people influenced by our discipline to think that we can let prices do the work of morals. Prices are going to be how we evaluate things, and as long as the prices are right, then we'll actually implement good outcomes. Uh, we have seen during the pandemic so many examples in which price, prices cannot do the work of morals. Um, let me turn to a particularly egregious part of that, which is employment. 
Um, these women are working in a meat packing uh, um, establishment in the United States. Many of them uh, resisted going to work, as, as a matter of fact, collectively. They were told if they didn't come to work, they would be fired. They had families, of course they came to work. Many of them got sick and some of them passed away. Uh, now, when we think about that, we think, wow, isn't that some kind of abuse of power? Do we really want to have the private exercise of power over such life and death matters? Many people during the pandemic began to think, no, maybe there's something different about employment, different from buying a loaf of bread, that should have a particular normative and moral framework. Now, in economics, the power, well, we have power, we have bargaining power, we have purchasing power, but power in the ordinary political vernacular sense, uh, we don't much have. Um, now, this exercise of power, as I said, is a problem, or can be a problem, in a democratic society, and it was invisible in economics until the so-called information revolution, starting with Friedrich Hayek's great paper, The Role of Knowledge in Society in 1945, but continuing on with Herbert Simon uh, and Ronald Coase and others. So the, the power has been there, there's a space for power in economics, but we haven't taken yet the next step. Uh, let me give you also some ideas that come from other um, areas. Um, the normative framework that we have, roughly, is fairness, liberty, and efficiency. Um, but what about some other terms? Um, now, in the United States, perhaps also in Italy, uh, left of center people have embraced a kind of a, a motto or a rhetoric, which is called shared affluence. Uh, we should more widely share the benefits of economic growth. But if you think about what people care about, and also if you think about some of the reactions against the centrist and left of center governments going on in the world today, people care about freedom, they care about dignity, being respected, um, uh, most people also care a lot about sustainability. So somehow we have to think beyond this idea that we're going to share the growing pie a little more fairly. On the screen I have some fantastic works that I've learned a lot from and that I suspect if you read, maybe you have read them, you would find yourself like me saying, yes, that's what I believe. Uh, but if you do believe that, then I think we have to think a bit differently about how employment and firms are structured. Um, now, let's think about the, the authoritarian policies of employment. Um, it was initially, or uh, a century ago, it was something about which economists talk. Ronald Coase has a theory of the firm which is ironically very close to the theory of the firm of Karl Marx, despite the fact that Coase is uh, one of the key figures in the Chicago school uh, uh, way of thinking. And listen to what he says. It's so, he has it exactly right. If a workman moves from department Y to department X, he does not go because of a change in prices, but because he's ordered to do so. The distinguishing mark of the firm is the suppression of the price system and the character of the contract is that the worker, for a certain remuneration, agrees to obey the directions of the employer. To obey. This is not an exchange. This is a system of discipline. Well, if Coase is a highly respected guy, how come our first year students don't learn about power? Not in the undergraduates, not in the PhD programs. Why is that? Well, a, a, a wonderful, magical, disappearing act took place. The first thing was that if we assume that contracts are complete, there is nothing for power to be about. It's all in the contract. So I don't order you to do something. If you don't do it, I don't pay you. That's the view that we have in economics. A complete contract pushes politics off the table. Uh, and then there's another thing which is important. Uh, this is, th those of you who are economists here will uh, immediately understand this. If the contracts are complete, markets will clear in a competitive equilibrium. So the complete contracting argument is essential because what it means is that if you lose your job, 
you go across the street and you've got another job because the market clears. So that's a very neat assumption because it means there's nothing for power to be about and my ability to fire you doesn't, cannot inflict any harm on you at all because the clearing markets mean that you can get a job at no cost. Um, now, the result of this was really profound. David Gautier is a very distinguished philosopher. I first met him, by the way, at the Certosa di Pontignano. I was very grateful to be part of, for many, many years, over now four decades, of the summer schools and other institutions that were held there. And um, here's what Gautier says. The presumption of free activity assumes that no one is subjected to any form of compulsion or any type of limitation not already affecting her actions as a solitary individual. Morality, listen to this, read the last sentence. Morality has no application to market interaction under conditions of perfect competition. Wow, is that I asked him at the, at the workshop in, uh, in Pontignano, I said, you must mean perfect competition with complete contracts. And he said, yes, that's what he meant. Uh, now, David Gautier is known as a conservative. Kenneth Arrow uh, in, published a paper about why he was a socialist. Um, and here's what he said. Any complaints about the market system's operation can be reduced to complaints about the distribution of income. The price system itself determines the distribution of only in the sense of preserving the status quo. So no criticism of the market except for distribution. Now, uh, it of course wasn't too long before economists were thought that words like boss and employee didn't mean anything. So here's a very popular textbook from the middle of the last century. Calling the employer the boss is a custom derived from the fact that the boss specifies the particular task. But one could have called the employee the boss because he orders the employer to pay him a specific sum. So our students are being taught that there's no power relationship between the boss and the worker. Ask those ladies at the packing plant in Kansas about the fact that they can order the boss to pay them things. Uh, I don't think they would even understand the question. Um, now, I, I want to move on a bit. Um, this model that has become popular in economics and fortunately is being eroded today by recent research in both theory and empirical stuff, what it did was it shielded the, the private government of the firm from democratic or libertarian or other kinds of interrogation. And it, it came to dominate economics. Now here is, you've, of course you've heard uh, Robin's definition of economics about scarce resources and uh, given ends. But this is a much better definition of neoclassical economics. An economic transaction, which is expressed in a contract, is a solved political problem. Economics has gained the title queen of the social sciences by choosing solved political problems as its domain. Uh, now, of course, that domain of complete contracts was never very large. Oh, here's where the shrinking comes in. Yes, it's certainly, the part about shrinking capitalism, it got shrunk. Uh, I, I like the title so much that I kept the title, but um, the, the domain in which complete contracts works. Okay, some kinds of shopping, that's why shopping is so important in textbooks, because that, there's where you actually have a com more or less complete contract. Uh, and it appears likely that that domain of complete contracts will shrink even further uh, with we have, we have much more information goods, uh, knowledge as a, as a good and so on. In particular, look at where the economy is going. Very few people are engaged in manufacturing. Most people are engaged in doing things like what we're doing now, talking to each other, persuading each other, entertaining each other, I hope, entertaining each other and so on, taking care of old people and so on. Now, um, I want to review some things which I think microeconomic theorists now agree on about employment. This is what is taught to PhD students, not yet to undergraduates, except here at University of Siena, where the introductory course does include mention of these things. The principal, the employer or the lender, exercises power over the agent, the borrower or the employee. That power may be abused at limited, effectively zero cost by the principal. And that includes such things as sexual harassment, racial insults, and so on. Social norms, truth-telling, intrinsic desire to do a good job, 
are essential to sustaining exchanges and a high productivity economy. And these allocations are Pareto inefficient, not sometimes, but necessarily. Um, now, if you look at those results, don't you immediately think, wow, that gives us like an agenda of policies. Because if all of those things are true, there are many, many things we want to be criticizing and thinking, how can we deal with them? So, for example, if the principal exercises power, we can think, of, well, how can that power be made accountable in ways more consistent with democratic norms? Through co-determination, through worker ownership, through all kinds of consultations and so on. If the power can be abused, shouldn't we enhance individual rights in the workplace? Uh, <clears throat> if social norms are essential, don't we have to worry about the sustaining of social norms of intrinsic uh, joy in doing work and so on as our societies become more unequal? Don't we have to worry that we're not going to sustain those uh, values uh, in a highly unequal and hierarchical society? And of course, if the allocations are inefficient, it means we have a little bit of room to maneuver in terms of implementing things in which there is a potential net benefit and very few losers. So let me come back to the line. Can we do something about this line? Well, the two things I've talked about, the limits of private contract and government fiat, Oh, by the way, the fact that contracts are incomplete means also that governments are extremely limited in what they can do, and it's for exactly the same reason. That is, if you can't write a complete contract, you cannot also write a complete fiat. It's almost, I mean, there is the, this argument, the reason why I go back to Hayek is because these ideas came from Hayek critiquing governments, but they're equally applicable to managers. Uh, okay, we're good. So here's the idea not a line, a simplex. This triangle, every point in the triangle is now a combination of civil society, state, and um, uh, government, uh, state and market. So, just to be clear, consider fix on some point in the simplex and think about it as having coordinates, three numbers, they sum to one. So the coordinates of every point are the weights on each of the vertices. So, I don't know if this will work, but if I won't. A point which was at civil society, right there at the bottom, that would be some kind of institution which just was relying on the kinds of preferences, reciprocity, altruism, so on, implemented by presumably uh, uh, social norms and private power and so on. So points are some combination in our policy world. Uh, now here are some examples. Uh, I, locating them is a bit arbitrary, but if you look at the upper left, um, uh, unconditional basic income. That's a government program. There's not much to do with markets and not much to do with civil society. Uh, but if you look at, um, for example, democratic firms, democratic firms, if they're to operate properly, would have to embody some of all of these things. Market competition to eliminate the losers, some state framework to provide a legal uh, uh, framework for it, and presumably some kinds of reciprocity and cooperativeness among workers, and so on. Uh, open science, for example, would be somewhere be along the government and civil society part. And there are many other examples. Ho care work at home, which is of course quantitatively very important, would be also located there. So, uh, when I developed these ideas with Wendy Carlin, uh, that was uh, before the pandemic. And so this is kind of an out-of-sample uh, forecast, uh, or out-of-sample robustness test. Uh, if you look here, I won't go through them all, you'll see that some things are state policies. Some of them are primarily markets, and a lot of them, like how we got vaccines so fast, are somewhere in the middle because they're a fantastic combination of the dedication of the scientists and their incredible hard work, which had to do with their intrinsic desire to save people and presumably also to get re recognized for their work. Uh, huge public funding, a lot of competition among major firms and so on. Uh, again, I would, the German healthcare system is another example of something kind of in the middle of that. Uh, now I think this is how we should be thinking about policies and institutions. Bringing into play the kinds of motives that are associated with, physis, phys, uh, with civil society and also the dangers, I mentioned tribalism, 
but also the tremendous power of social norms to make a policy work and the inability of policies to work if they, are, if they run counter to social norms. This is a picture of Wendy Carlin and me just over there some years ago. Uh, we were talking about a new educational program for changing how intro economics is taught. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the conversations from all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Very interesting. <clears throat> now we have a distinguished panel of discussants, all coming from the University of Siena, where Sam has taught in, in the past, right? I think I've given lectures here for 40 years, so, okay, uh, so. more or less. Uh, so, yes, I have thought here a bit. Um, so we have, uh, <clears throat> we have today these three discussants, uh, who are, the first of them is Alessandra Rossi. Um, her main field of interest are intellectual property, the knowledge economy, uh, and so Alessandra, the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you very much, Alfredo, and good morning, everyone. I'm actually not anymore at uh, Siena University teaching, but I'm very happy to be back home because I've been here for many years. So, and, and that's why I want to thank for the opportunity of being here and, and commenting on such a thoughtful and thought-provoking uh, speech by Sam. So my perspective today, the one, the, the the lens that I want to propose on um, Sam's talk um, is really a link between what we've been discussing yesterday in this conference and uh, Sam's perspective. Actually, I'll take the liberty of looking at, of going beyond what he has presented today uh, to incorporate a broader uh, view. Um, so yesterday we've been discussing basically two main arguments. One is family capitalism and the other is democratization of, uh, of the firm, the adoption of uh, more inclusive and democratic uh, means of organizing the firm. Um, how does Sam's argument relate to what we have discussing yesterday? And to, to explore this connection, I think it's nice, uh, it's useful uh, to summarize very briefly the core of his argument. He really has a threefold view. Uh, today he has presented basically two aspects, a normative aspect according to which it is important to focus on dignity and power when it comes to analyzing capitalism. And the second aspect of his view has to do with what we should be concerned as economists and what counts as economics. Uh, so how the economic discipline has evolved and should evolve. There is a third aspect that shrunk in today's presentation and is more the positive aspect of the analysis. So the positive aspect of the analysis has to do with the fact that the hierarchical, it was just briefly mentioned today, and has to do with the fact that the hierarchical form of organization, because of contract incompleteness, because of contract incompleteness, is less and less useful, has a lower comparative advantage in organizing production in today's economy. So three broad uh, aspects of the, of the argument, a normative one, a positive one, and one that reflects on discipline. So the normative uh, view and also the reflection on how economists should deal with these issues is fully in line with what we have been discussing yesterday because the call to take into consideration dignity, to incorporate power in the analysis, is certainly something that is coherent with the view that we should be thinking about democratizing capitalism, we should be thinking about how the current form of organization, of familiar organization, impedes uh, the um, productive, uh, productiveness and also uh, um, growth of the economy. So I, I will not focus on this because I think this is 
not controversial. So uh, I, I, I just want to stress that I think it is very important uh, one aspect that was implicit in, was, in what Sam has said so far, that is we should be thinking about how to incorporate rights, fundamental rights, including freedom, um, in our uh, view of the economy and how we can leverage these rights to improve the functioning of the economy. So no question about the normative side and the interpretation of how economists should look at these. Where, when it comes to the positive analysis, so the view according to which the uh, hierarchical form of organization is not suited to the current uh, economy, it is shrinking because the knowledge part of the economy, the importance, uh, the incompleteness of contracts contrasts with the ability of using conventional forms of uh, organization of production. There, I'm, I can add a bit of spice to the discussion because I'm not convinced by the argument. And the reason why I'm not convinced is that I do agree that power relationships uh, are one key defining feature of capitalism, but I see these power relationships coming from the ownership of capital assets rather than from the labor relationship itself. So it's good that we place more attention on the labor relationship, but I do think that the aspect that it's, it's really defining capitalism today is ownership of capital assets. And I see in this regard two evolutions. One is that the scope of what counts as capital asset has incredibly expanded. So I've worked a long, for a long time on intellectual property. I'm working on data. Uh, I, I, I just want to mention one very small uh, instance that is not quantitatively and empirically important right now, uh, but it's kind of a preview of what may happen. And this is non-fungible tokens, Web3, the metaverse. So what it is, what has to do with capitalism? Non-fungible tokens are an instantiation of really the digitalization, the, the financialization of digital assets and the, the key of these assets is that they don't even require the state, the coercive power of the state to back them. So it's really an extreme. We don't know where it will end, but it's, it's surely something that is telling us that uh, uh, the scope of what is capital is expanding, is not shrinking. So that's one aspect. Second aspect, the global organization of production, the ubiquitous increasing returns and scale economies, this is something that requires uh, hierarchical organization to be, and that, that is still, I, see, I think, a comparative advantage of uh, uh, hierarchical organization. So where does this um, uh, take us? I see the power of the hierarchical organization increasing, not shrinking. What this means for me is that the hierarchical and capitalist form of organization is uh, more able than before to adapt, to change, to incorporate novel ways of uh, distributing rents given traditional contracts, but with a different twist. Think about Google. The type of contracts that uh, Google employees have are standard contracts legally, but still Google has many ways of leveraging intrinsic and extrinsic motivations and to overcome the problems of in contractual incompleteness that Sam has rightly pointed out. So the increasing power I see is something that gives the capitalist firm an advantage in the distribution of rents. It is more and more possible to extract consumer surplus, so there is more to redistribute. There is scope for adapting. Uh, what are the implications of this to connect to yesterday's uh, vision? 
so if uh, Sam's view, yes, if Sam's view um, on the positive side uh, is correct, much of what we have been discussing yesterday uh, doesn't make sense. Why? Because, for instance, the size of the firm is not such a big problem. Hmm? If, as uh, I proposed, uh, capitalism is not shrinking, what we've been discussing yesterday, including the size of the firm, the ability to grow, uh, etc., uh, remain important problems. This doesn't jeopardize the normative aspect of Sam's argument, so it is fully coherent with the idea of democratization. And let me just say the, the very last thing. Um, it, it is very important to uh, go beyond looking, if capitalism is there to stay, the, the hierarchical form of organization is there to stay, perhaps there is a need of a shift of focus towards discipline, how technology evolves a point that was made by the late Robert Atkinson and, and that uh, has been explored by the Forum, uh, by the forum di Suguaglianza e Diversità uh, in Italy. Uh, let's go beyond and look also at how technology can be changed. Thank you very much, Alessandra. So it's not shrinking. <laughs> she, says it, she says it's I, not I shrinking. <laughs> Um, abbiamo adesso, now we have uh, Massimo D'Antoni, uh, University of Siena. This time I'm right, right? Yes. You are from the University <laughs> of Siena. His fields are welfare economics, law and economics, uh, and so on. So, and so on. it's up to you. Did you switch it yeah, I switched on. Yeah, thank you. Um, I must say, I, I, I mostly agree with the, the proposal by Sam with Wendy Carlin of a, a new the idea of a new paradigm to replace the neoliberal one, uh, and this paradigm should uh, introduce this third uh, pole uh, to government and market, uh, represented by civil society, to provide social norms, reciprocity, the exercise of private power. I, I completely agree on all this, and I also agree on the uh, importance of recognizing uh, uh, recognize the role played by power, which has not, given, has not been given a proper role in standard economics, while instead it's at the center of the working of the, of the firm, of the capitalist firm. No surprise, I agree. I, I've been influenced by, by Sam's paper since I was a student. I still remember how, uh, how, uh, how I liked, for example, his article of the mid-'80s. Uh, it was one of the first articles I've ever read from a journal. And so uh, I'm not certainly say anything unexpected. However, j just because my general agreement, let me point to some uh, possible doubles or... Uh, minor points on which uh, I, I, I may not be completely in, in line. Uh, first, uh, uh, relates to, related to what Alessandra say, is, is capitalism shrinking? Shrinking capitalism, they, they explain, is both uh, uh, a descriptive and a prescriptive uh, title. And about the descriptive, uh, uh, I'm a bit puzzled, I must say, about this uh, idea that uh, capitalism is, uh, is shrinking because of uh, information-based uh, economy. Well, wh what you say is that uh, um, the, new, I mean, the, 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 the new productive situation brings to the fore models like uh, open source or open science, uh, uh, and, and this is the first. The second is uh, Amazon-style monitoring. Uh, which, by the way, uses, uh, again, uh, uh, devices as a uh, reputation reviews extensively as a way of, of controlling workers. And third, a return to peace right payment from independent contractor. And well, what you, you, you seem to say that this amounts to shrinking of capitalism. I suspect that this conclusion is because you adopt uh, quite a narrow what I consider a narrow definition of what capitalism is, which is, by the way, it's the same definition that you have in your, in your textbook, I know very well. When we had to translate, uh, let me tell you this, 
and you uh, define the capitalized firm and, send, and then you compare capitalized firm to the family firm on the one hand, the public firm on the other hand, I came to the conclusion that Italy wasn't a capitalist country because most of production is carried on in family run firm and public firm. So, uh, well, maybe that, uh, I mean, may, maybe this, this is uh, okay with the American capitalism, but I, if we consider capitalism in a more in a broader way, uh, I don't know if, because I, I think the conclusion comes from the fact that you consider that at the core of the capitalism is the capitalism firm where uh, um, workers sell their time in exchange for a wage. So uh, a piece rate payment uh, is outside capitalism. I'm not sure I, 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 complete, uh, I completely agree with this. And also, uh, let, let me give you a more pessimistic account of what's going on in this respect. Um, you, you point to the fact that power must be accountable. And among the way you, you make power accountable within the firm is collective act actions by unions, rights, uh, uh, rights by workers, and uh, ethics and norms. Well, uh, couldn't it be that a move to this uh, contracting out of many functions that were carried uh, within the firm is due exactly as a way to escape this accountability. So it's a move of capitalism to increase the power, not to reduce it. So maybe it's not capitalist, uh, capitalism anymore, but uh, uh, I, 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 I'm afraid that uh, saying that capitalism is shrinking may convey uh, some kind of optimistic view, maybe, which uh, while instead we, we have probably larger problems in the, in the, in, with respect to, to power. And this is one thing. Second point uh, is uh, regard the, with regard to the third poll, I agree that civil society must have a role. Only I have a, a, a minor problem is why you place private power in civil society and not in market? Well, I agree that market is, in that case, the, the pole of the market is a perfectly competitive market, but shouldn't we instead modify that poll by, in, in the direction suggested by Coase and others by saying that in the market poll there is the firm and within the firm we have power. Because otherwise the idea that power is in civil society, again, uh, is, is not something I, I, I'm completely comfortable with. Second point, this is a more general in terms of, uh, I, I couldn't help uh, noticing that the three polls correspond to the three main uh, social sciences, like, well, government is political science, market economics, and civil society is the, 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 is the realm of, of sociology. So what's the idea? Um, knowing you, I, 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 I think the idea of having a, a general unifying social science, but I must say that when I um, hear economies that uh, uh, have this idea of a of a broader science and step into other disciplines, a shiver runs down my spine because I know, I know what has happened before. Uh, econ economists have dealt with the government and we've had public choice and political, uh, political economics, uh, which leave aside a lot of interesting things that political science know, scientists know about, uh, about uh, the, the working of politics. And again, uh, we've had uh, many economists uh, studying uh, uh, so the, the civil, civil society, but I don't know, well, what, what is it, the backer with the family? <laughs> I don't think we have that in mind, but this uh, tendency of uh, economics to be so expansionistic, some say imperialistic, is, uh, is, um, makes me think that maybe a division of work where different disciplines hear one another would be a better idea than having a unified discipline possibly dominated by the economic paradigm. Okay, the paradigm might change, I agree, but... Uh, another point is... Uh, one minute. Okay, uh, I, I'm very short. Um, emblematic policies, and another ingredient of a paradigm shift. Uh, you, you haven't talked a lot about that, so I, I, I won't either. I must say that I am uh, more uh, convinced by what we could call the pre-distribution policies than the redistribution one. By redistribution, I mean your proposal of uh, 
a wealth tax uh, or universal unconditional basic income or home price insurance, I'm a bit skeptical, especially, uh, well, wealth tax is very popular at the moment, but the historical record is not so good, and uh, I think for some reason. Uh, if I have just last, uh, last but very short point is the paradigm shift uh, that you have in mind that brings to the fore civil society, I think, should be accompanied by something more deeper at the philosophical level. So I think here there's a problem for probably for liberalism as a philosophical view based on the individualism, neutrality with respect to values, uh, contractual view of society, universal limits, etc. And uh, I think you're aware of the risk. Uh, well, I, I'm sympathetic with the more communitarian views, but we must be aware of what it might imply in terms of uh, identity, you call it tribalism. Uh, so identity is double faced because on the one hand it provides values, motivations, uh, common sense, but we know that it has also has some drawbacks. Thank you. Thank you, Massimo. A lot of uh, suggestions here and uh, in the preceding uh, talk. Now we have uh, Stefano Bartolini, also from the University of Siena. Um, he has uh, written uh, about the economy uh, of happiness and social capital. These are his themes. Stefano, the floor is, your, the floor is yours. Okay, many thanks for inviting me. I found uh, two great virtues in this paper. Uh, the first one uh, is that it ends with the opposition between the government and, and markets. Uh, in some sense, it ends with the uh, 20th century, because the 20th century has been the, se the century of the uh, opposition of the state and the market, which was economic, uh, cultural, political, and even military. I'm thinking of the Cold War, of course. And uh, it, it was clear in the 19th century that there was a third pole between the state and the market. I'm thinking of the uh, European socialists. They had it clear that existed what uh, Sam calls uh, community, civil society. I would call it social capital, but it's the same thing. And uh, it disappeared, this third alternative, uh, well, alternative, it pu he puts it as a... Okay, better now? Farther. Um, well, he, it's not a real alternative in, in uh, Sam's terms, because it's a complement of the state and the market. Both cannot work uh, well without social capital. And, uh, but it disappeared in the 20th century, this alternative, this third pole, I mean, because, uh, well, it was a Marxism, uh, Lenin, Leninism that uh, uh, attracted as an alternative to the market just the state. It, it just focused on the state, uh, so the third pole disappeared from history. Now it's coming out again. And the second reason for uh, the second big virtue that I find in this paper is that uh, it probably overcomes the main reason why Marxism failed in promoting uh, uh, large-scale economic change. Um, because Marxism looked at, at, uh, uh, was looking for uh, a total alternative to capitalism. Well, I think uh, uh, I would rephrase uh, what uh, Sam says, uh, writes, uh, in this way, probably very radical. Capitalism doesn't exist. Capitalism as a pure form uh, of, uh, of an economic system has never existed. No societies have ever been organized uh, only based on uh, the private sector and competition and private capitals. In, uh, in what we call capitalist countries, the state control all allocates from a minimum of the 40% of the GDP in the US from 
to up to 60% of GDP in uh, Northern European countries. So uh, pure capitalism doesn't exist. The only pure form of, of economy that ever existed has been state socialism in which the state was the sole owner and the sole organizer of economic activity. Uh, but what we call uh, capitalism uh, has always been a mixed economy, a hybrid economy, uh, which includes uh, a more or less massive state intervention associated to many forms of cooperation between uh, uh, persons and, organ and or organizations beyond a lot of competition, of course. Sam recognizes this when uh, speaks about, when says that beyond the state and the market that there's a third pole. Um, well, once we recognize that capitalism is, uh, what we call capitalism, is just a hybrid form of economy, uh, a mixed economy, then and, and, and a question comes out natural. What is the place, what is the function of the capitalist sector of the economy within these mixed economies? Well, it is not uh, the one that has been indicated by the new liberal utopia, uh, which was stating that a uh, well-functioning society can be built simply on, uh, based on uh, the pursuit of material interests and uh, the most desirable uh, kind of society is the one in which competition is widespread to all the spheres of social life. This is an utopia that we must overcome because a society cannot work without collective action. As everybody knows now after COVID, uh, we, deal, we dealt with COVID uh, very largely based on collective action, as uh, Sam points out. Uh, in front of big collective threats, we need collective action. Uh, climate change had exactly, had exactly the same effect in uh, making it clear that collective action is the only one that can solve collective crisis. Um, so what is the role of the capitalist sector of the economy? Well, uh, in my view, uh, it is a very powerful and very dangerous tool. It is very powerful because it has an enormous power to produce uh, material progress, uh, uh, the progress that can be produced uh, by the expansion of private goods. And it is very dangerous because it tends to colonize all spheres of social life. Uh, between, um, well, it colonizes uh, the natural environment, time, uh, politics, uh, the space, information, the community, even human relationships, and even childhood, as uh, schooling uh, should be aimed at the labor market. Uh, it, everything is colonized by, well, capitalism. The capitalist sector of the economy has the tendency to colonize all spheres of social life. We, uh, uh, societies have always known that. Uh, if you read the great transformation by Karl Polanyi, he reconstructed the whole history of the capitalism as a tension between the capitalist sector of the economy and his tendency to invade the, the all social life. And uh, he points out that societies has always defended themselves from this invasion because uh, a society cannot work well when uh, it is dominated by commercial logics in all spheres. Of, uh, one minute, okay. Um, this idea that uh, societies can work without collective action and that uh, society doesn't exist, there are only individuals, as Margaret Thatcher said, has brought us uh, uh, to the disaster, the current disaster that we face, the uh, ecological crisis, the crisis of social capital, of human relationships. Uh, we live in societies in which uh, uh, loneliness has become uh, a mass problem. Uh, we need to know that capitalism, capitalism must be must do the thing that it does very well, 
just to produce material progress. And it must be excluded from uh, many other areas uh, of the society. We must also to understand that market, the market system uh, needs sociability. Uh, market transaction, transactions work much better uh, if there is trust among people. And uh, so I think that removing the way, the, removing the idea that uh, we should invent a total alternative to capitalism, uh, it can be triggered a process of social change uh, uh, aimed uh, at uh, making capitalism doing what it does, what it has to do, and not all the rest. Uh, many thanks for your attention. Thank you, Stefano. Um, I'll, now I'll give the floor again to Sam for some uh, uh, conclusions and uh, to answer some of the questions because there have been many. May I add just one micro question of mine? Uh, you mentioned some in the paper that the perception of the, of the idea of capitalism, at least uh, in the US, has turned toward the negative. Is that is that true? I, I wanted to, if you could elaborate just a little bit on that. Thank you. No, I just would like to um, make a point about uh, the relation between uh, uh, what we discussed yesterday and uh, um, some of the work that has been done uh, in the forum about democratization and uh, this view that Sam has about power. I think that uh, uh, my view is that capital is expanding. We have had uh, a movement of enclosures in uh, these years for uh, intangible assets that is very similar to the one that we had uh, for land in the past. Now, this has moved uh, the exercise of power from the firm, from inside the firm, to relation between the firm and the other firms to which a lot of activities were outsourced. So power has really moved back very much you know, to the market. That is what has happened. Now, this has triggered a big discussion in the forum because of what we felt that is a bit outdated about the German model is that if we democratize the firm, we tend to forget about all the firms that have a subordinate role and where things have been outsourced and uh, where uh, basically a part of the chain value, but uh, in the chain value, they have some burden of power. Now, how to try to uh, include, uh, you know, these firms in the democratization is a very big issue. You know, they are stakeholders, then you should expand the role of stakeholders. It's not easy and uh, it's a bit complicated to make the German model having that. But certainly, for instance, Lorenzo Sacconi and some of the proposals of the forum were very much in trying to have representatives, you know, of these firms and parts of the chain value in this attempt to democratization, exactly because the idea is that the exercise of power has moved from within the firm to market relations. Thanks. Un'altra domanda qua e un'altra e un qui Grazie. e qui e basta. Uh, e basta. Also somehow linking to the debate in yesterday, uh, I think we are all, and personally I am, very uh, in sympathetic with the spirit and the uh, you know, general call of, of, uh, of the relation. Uh, what... <coughs> I, 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 I have doubt of, uh, about is whether power can save us. I mean, this call for uh, you know, infusing the concept of power is something useful or something that helps us. Uh, I would say uh, that uh, actually the, the theory that you refer, the basic theory we all come from, uh, like Coase and even more Hart, has basically arguing that uh, given that the, uh, when contracts fail, the solution is power. And the glue keeping the firm together, worked by heart, is power. 
plain power. Uh, this is turning Marx on, on his head. You know, the, the firm is, uh, is just a power relation and, uh, and turning on his head because, of course, the, the argument is it is efficient <laughs> rather than uh, com to be adverse precisely for this power base. So, uh, with the other, to the, the more organizational, Simon, even Williamson, uh, is somehow different because they refer to legitimate authority and not to power in this sense as a solution to failing contract. So, uh, I, I, the, uh, the, the argument could be the, is the alternative uh, that can be a base for a civil society perhaps something different, which is uh, for other turn to a social contract, a different type of contract. And uh, finally, uh, I just want to mention other ways of expanding the basic continuum and two poles. Let me quote just Alan Fiske, for example, the four basic forms of sociality, authority, ranking, market pricing, uh, communal sharing, and equality matching. So this, in and this is in agreement with what Antoni said. Uh, the, to us, <laughs> putting private power in, in as a basis of civil society or even identity, the tribalism with all this side uh, uh, among the foundation of a different poll sounds not promising. Thank you. Next question here. Um, yes. Um, there is a, an ongoing debate between Sam and me on some aspects of his general view. And um, I will only very briefly say that um, my point of view is rather different. I do not agree that with complete contracts there would be full employment of resources. Uh, it seems to me that there is one important problem missing in uh, Sam's uh, views on things, the macroeconomic issues, unemployment. Uh, I think everybody here who has children around the age 25, 30, and so on and so forth, know that unemployment is a very big problem. Unemployment depends on government decisions. Government decisions depend on the power relationships between classes. These are more important than what's happening inside firms. Even cooperative firms cannot change much except marginally on what people do when they go and work. The important thing is the general power relationship which can control things like conditions of work, right to fire people, and unemployment. And, uh, the idea that complete contracts would ensure full employment depends on having forgotten about the problem of what determines aggregate demand. And this de comes from having forgotten that nowadays uh, the theory behind this idea that complete contracts would ensure full employment is general equilibrium theory. And general equilibrium theory nowadays can only be formulated for intertemporal equilibria, which must assume the folly, the absurdity of complete contracts for the entire future with perfect foresight. This is simply a myth. It's totally wrong. And we have to understand that we live in a society in which Kaletsky is the one who said the correct thing, which is the moment full employment gives enough strength to workers, we're going to have again Reagan and the Thatcher reimposing unemployment. And the, uh, the, th the happiness economics shows that unemployment uh, is the most important cause of unhappiness in modern societies. Thank you. Uh, now, the, Stefano, the last question. Yes. <clears throat> I just wanted to be reassured in a way. Um, I like very much your triangle, uh, Sam. And the good thing about the triangle, 
is that feasible solutions don't touch the borders. Um, I don't think there are feasible solutions functioning market economies that don't lie somewhere inside the triangle. Um, and so perhaps if today there is so much discussion about power again, um, this may have something to do with um, these, what these over-the-top companies have been doing, uh, m having managed to be out of context, out of any context. Uh, but it is already clear that there will be a reaction, and the reaction will tend to bring uh, um, the equilibrium point back inside the triangle. Uh, but left alone, and this is where I w I'm not sure that I disagree with Stefano, but you said something that um, worried me a little bit. Uh, um, the idea that the uh, side, the market side, uh, can stand up on its own and provide our prosperity out of any set of values and um, um, contributing visions of social relationship, I don't think can stand. Uh, this is my comment. Maybe it's a question, I don't know. Thank you very much, Stefano. Now I give the floor to you, Sam, for a final wrap-up. Uh, can I have one of those uh, gelatos there? Thank you. Just a second. Si, è funzionante, ma lo devo pulire. Uh, th thanks very much. What a wonderful bunch of uh, comments and questions. I've taken uh, a huge uh, amount of notes. Uh, I can begin by saying I agree entirely with, with what you say, Stefano, about uh, that. Uh, I would like to comment on all of the questions. Um, and let me go quickly. I can do some of the economics uh, quickly. Uh, to Fabio, um, this is a conversation going on over 20, 30 years, uh, so I won't try to <laughs> go into the whole thing. But remember, I did not say that incomplete contracts was the cause of unemployment. What I said is in the dominant theory of economics, if you have complete contracts, you have clearing markets. That's true. Of course that's true. And Fabio knows that. Uh, Fabio says, oh, that's not the reason why we have unemployment. I didn't say it was. Obviously, why we have unemployment has to do with aggregate demand and so on. I'm talking about a body of science, scholarship, and so on, which has contributed to our getting off the table the question of power, and that's complete contracts. And the, the fact that it includes this very clever uh, aspect, which is not only is there nothing for power to be about, but the person who seems to have some power doesn't, because if he fires you, you can get a job at the same, uh, at the same terms. That's not reality, but that is what's taught. Um, so I don't think we disagree, actually, Fabio, about what causes unemployment. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, uh, I, thought, I thought Stefano's, uh, uh, the other Stefano's suggestion was, uh, uh, there are two, two things which I would like to underline, not as a response, but to put on our, our agenda. The first is, what are the foundations for the recreation of and the, uh, in, uh, for a robust and democratic social capital? How can we expect to do that? How do we expect people to learn that? They presumably learn it by doing it. So we have to provide in society arenas in which people exercise those cognitive and democratic rights of discussion, compromise, and so on. I think uh, a modern capitalist society is really lacking in those arenas. Uh, whether it be neighborhoods or workplaces or other associations. Uh, and it's, by the way, it's very, uh, uh, I mean, the, the title of this conference about state and family, uh, in economic theory, there are only two entities that really matter uh, other than firms. And one is families and the other is states. What about neighborhoods? What about clubs? What about associations? What about friendships and so on? So let's think about how do we, how do we, create a society which will, every generation, create lots of people who have democratic social capital as just part of their identity. I don't know the answer to that, but I think we should be thinking that. Um, the second thing is, um, Stefano said capitalism should be confined to the things it, which it, it does well. Uh, and um, 
uh, okay, uh, that seems like a sensible idea. But I, what I say in the paper, which, uh, which I circulated, is the, the arena of things that it does well is shrinking. And the reason why the arena of things it does well is shrinking is because it does things relatively well where contracts are complete. And so much of what we're doing today, I mean, I mentioned them. Uh, think of all the things that people do. One in seven people in America, uh, that is in the labor force, are engaged in manufacturing, agriculture, or mining. One in seven. The other six are taking care of old people, raising young people, contributing to our health, entertaining us, and so on. Uh, those are not arenas in which buying and selling things like wheat or, or, uh, or steel is a good model for how we get the job done. Um, now, uh, both Alessandra and Ugo reminded me of something very important. Um, I left out of my talk uh, economies of scale. It's hugely important. Um, and we used to think, uh, for example, that, uh, you know, okay, economies of scale, or by the way, we never teach economies of scale. We always teach a long-run average cost curve is U-shaped. Try to find some evidence for that. I've been writing textbooks, and therefore I look for evidence. No, it's either flat or it's downward sloping. That's a new world in which we operate. And in, in that world, the kinds of, of considerations that Alessandra raised and also that Ugo raised, uh, I spent most of my life thinking that the problem of equality was about relationships between employers and workers. That's wrong. I mean, that's part of it. Uh, it is, by the way, Ugo, I, of course, you didn't mean to say that wasn't important. But now the relationship between owners of firms and the people they're selling stuff to is another important dimension of exploitation. That's not a new idea. That was an important part of Koletsky's theory of income distribution. But we have to now have a model which has both the exploitation of consumers by the market power of sellers and the exploitation of workers if the wage is unfair. We can call it exploitation uh, uh, as part of the same, uh, the, the same theory. Uh, now, I wish I had time to do all of these, but I, I did have some, uh, some thoughts. Um, uh, yes, uh, very nice, Massimo, to point out that the title was descriptive uh, and prescriptive. Uh, shrinking is something which is happening, and also I think it would be good if we shrank it. Uh, that is, we should be doing it. Uh, the um, uh, Alessandro doesn't think it's shrinking. Um, I've given some reasons for shrinking, so we're saying maybe the realm in which it does a good job is shrinking. Um, uh, but also I think she's absolutely right in saying partly because of the economies of scale, which is not the only thing you mentioned, but it's a lot. I mean, the IPR is also uh, economies of scale because of the fixed costs. Um, so let's, let's talk about um, um, this, some background here. First is these are hugely difficult problems intellectually, and I know many people here are trying to figure out what we should do about it either theoretically or practically and so on. We're, I mean, we have a huge body of literature to go on, and the University of Siena has been in the forefront of good ideas on the topics we're talking about. I would say, I hope I'm not missing anybody, ever since Ugo Pagano's dissertation, which was just a few years back, I think, uh, and uh, about the relationship between workers and owners in, in firms. There's a tradition here which has made these issues front and center, so, and that's why I'm so happy to have been associated with this fantastic university for so long. Uh, there are questions about equality of what? Uh, I said, okay, equality in sharing the pie, maybe that isn't it. W why don't we try equal dignity? Let's think about that, equal dignity. Maybe that's what we're in favor of. Other people say equal freedom, uh, or you know, for example, Philippe Van Perez. But let's, let's think about our normative concern. What is it that we care about? What is it that really offends us when it is lacking? Um, now, by the way, when I raised the question of dignity, uh, I went back recently and I found my undergraduate copy of Wealth of Nations. And I had dutifully underlined the passage, which you all know, about um, uh, the, the, but the butcher, the baker, and the brewer. It's not their benevolence that puts the food on the table, it's their self-interest. Very nicely underlined, twice actually. Once first and the second one for the exam. I didn't underline the next sentence. In fact, I had forgotten entirely what is the next sentence. He says, only a beggar 
chooses to rely on the benevolence of other people. What? Adam Smith was not talking about the beggar, the butcher, and the brewer because it was efficient. He was talking about it because the market is an institution, according to Smith, that ensures dignity. That was his argument there. And of course, we take over that, it goes into something about Pareto efficiency and so on. Uh, so the, the idea that we should evaluate institutions for their dignity compatibility seems to me to be a pretty good one since, since Smith. Um, now, <clears throat> uh, uh, oh, I'm very glad, Alessandro, that you raised the question of applicability of the complete uh, contracting. Uh, here's an idea. Uh, we're interested, of course, in robots, in uh, artificial intelligence, and so on. Um, how about this? I don't know if it's true. Maybe you do. Uh, if a robot can do your job, it's probably the kind of job that can be described in a complete contract. In other words, the engineering problem of producing a robot to do these things has to do with very specific steps and so on. If there are such steps that an engineer could build in a machine, it's probably the case that it could also be written, maybe not identically, in a contract. But what does that mean? It means that AI and robotization is eliminating those jobs in which the assumptions underlying the ideological defense of capitalism works well. In other words, AI and robotization is eliminating jobs in which more or less complete contracts are possible. And it means the ones are left. The ones are left are like my daughter, who's an elementary school teacher or my son-in-law, who's a guard in a prison, or me, who's been a teacher all my life, or many people, all the jobs you know, that really you cannot write a complete contract for. Um, now, um, let me say something about, um, oh, to Massimo, uh, you're, you were upset because you like the bottom civil society <laughs> poll. And I do too. But remember, I put tribalism in there as well. Because I, I mean, what's a good example of social capital? In America, urban gangs. An urban gang is a perfect example. Huge loyalty. Uh, no, uh, not in generally a dominant, I didn't say mafia. I said, I said an urban gang in America. So we should not think about the, the social capital or the uh, civil society as uh, a necessarily good thing. Um, now, if, if you think about why did self-interest... Self-interest used to be called avarice. It was one of the deadly... Uh, it was one of the, one of the uh, most important sins. Mortal sin of avarice. And it became domesticated before Adam Smith, by the way. Self-interest became an okay thing. Why was that? Because the real problem in the 17th century was warfare, uh, was intolerance, was zealotry. Uh, now, so we, when, we, when we embrace civil society as a goal, we really have to think about the following. We have figured out a way to run a society based on a fair degree of self-interested action. It's called a modern market economy. We know how to do it. It, doesn't, it. it works pretty well in some ways. It's probably very threatening of the environment, but we're familiar with it. We understand how it works. Do we have an economic or social theory of how an economy based on reciprocity, altruism, uh, um, respect, and so on would work? We don't. And I think such an economy would be vulnerable to the development of intolerance and zealotry. Now, I don't mean we shouldn't go in that direction, but I mean, which one of you said liberalism maybe should be considered? <laughs> yes. Uh, I wrote a very, a very uh, from my heart, piece recently called The End of Liberalism. Now, many people in this room have spent their lives criticizing liberalism, either in the philosophical sense or in the economic sense. But when I, said, when I wrote this thing about the end of liberalism, it was another double entendre. It was the objective of liberalism, meaning the end in that sense, and the end meaning it's over. And my concern in that was that because I mean, liberalism saved itself in the beginning of the 20th century by extending the vote to the working class and to women. And that was a very big move. Had it not done that, it would have been all over for liberalism, I'm quite convinced. And now what? Liberalism is also under threat. 
How, how do we, and by the way, remember, what was the process by which the vote was extended? Working class people fought for that. And they, in other words, working class people made liberalism what we're now proud of, a democratic and liberty-enhancing body of thought. Do you think we can count on the working classes of the world today to defend liberalism? Where? Where would you see that? Not in America, unfortunately. So, another idea to put in your head. Uh, maybe socialism is the way of saving liberalism. Uh, maybe liberalism has to take another big step towards a radical kind of egalitarianism which will bring back on board a vast majority of people to this fantastic body of thought which makes freedom a central idea and is inclusive in, in arguing for freedom for all or as I would prefer, equal dignity. Um, one, one little thing, you, you don't like having private power there because you would like to live there like me. I kind of like that part of the, the thing. But remember, um, Coase said, uh, the firm involves the suppression of the price system. So that goes there. And it, certainly, it's not the, that's not a market. Inside the firm, you, uh, the problem is this. Firms, when they compete with each other, obviously, that's a market thing. The, 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 I mean, it's, it's hard to locate things because it, depending on whether you look at competition, with it, whether within firms or between firms, with the kind of thing Google was talking about. Um, is that it? Uh, Okay, well, listen, I'm, I'm so grateful to you for your comments on this, for your interest in my work with Wendy Carlin and the team with which I work. And, uh, of course, we'll continue, and I'll be here <laughs> next year and the year after. We'll continue the conversation. Thank you so much.